Our next keynote speaker is Sarah Boisvert. After over 20 years in manufacturing, Sarah was interested in helping close the skills gap, and she founded Fab Lab Hub, a part of the international Fab Lab network based at the MIT Center for Bits and Atoms. Fab Lab provides nationwide hands-on training for the new collar workforce to earn digital badges and fabrication skills like 3D printing, CAD design, robotics, AR, VR, design thinking, problem solving, and much more. In interviews with 200 U.S. manufacturers, Sarah noted that a paradigm shift was needed to bring back well-paying, engaging manufacturing careers for the middle-class Americans. In her book, The New Collar Workforce, Sarah describes the jobs open today in the digital factory and innovative training programs that prepare workers for jobs in this new world. Fab Lab Hub offers digital badges for new collar jobs that combine coursework with hands-on project-based learning in Fab Labs throughout the country. Located in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Sarah operates two Fab Labs focused on workforce training and entrepreneurship. They are founding members of the North American Digital Fabrication Alliance. We welcome Sarah Poivre today to enlighten us, the founder of the New Collar Network. Thank you so much, Devra. It's a real pleasure to be here, and it's been a, a really fabulous to, to work with you and, and with your team on bringing our New Collar job trainings to Hartford. Um, I, as Deborah mentioned, uh, come from manufacturing. I owned the company that built the laser, invented and built the laser for LASIK eye surgery, as well as a number of medical devices you hope you never need, coronary stents among them. Um, but I grew up in manufacturing. My father was a textile chemist and colorist, which is probably a job that doesn't exist anymore in Rhode Island, not far from where you all are located. And my dad, um, you know, provided for um, a really wonderful middle class life for us kids. And I went to a private school. Um, we would go on summer vacations. My mom, like many women of that generation, um, didn't work outside the home. Um, and it was really a lovely, um, a lovely upbringing. And what we have seen, as we all know over the years, is that the middle class is really being squeezed out. We have huge disparity between the very wealthy and the the people who are uh, struggling uh, to, to just to put bread on the table. And um, I wanna talk today about um, why I think the new color jobs can help bring back the middle class. And so uh, this is uh, a factory in Youngstown, Ohio that um, is not different than the factories where I grew up in New England and my dad, uh, went through a lot of that change in the textile industry as it moved south. Fortunately, he had an entrepreneurial spirit and started a company importing and exporting uh, textile chem chemicals and dyes uh, and uh, went on to, to have a successful career. But it really changed how he, he thought life was going to happen. And, and of course, not only did the jobs go to the south, they also uh, went to Asia and we started to see real changes in how manufacturing uh, was, was being impacted in the United States. With the impact of digital fabrication though, we're starting to see real changes. And down the street from that uh, burned out factory that, uh, that you saw um, is America Makes. America Makes is the National Additive Manufacturing Institute. And this is a, picture I took on my phone, but if you could see inside, that storefront is filled with every kind of 3D printer that you can imagine. Everything doing uh, bioprinting, doing metal printing, uh, some really sophisticated tools. And this is the kind of transformation we're starting to see that is uh, coming about because of digital tools. Um, 
blue collar jobs then are now digital and uh what the um what many people are calling the fourth industrial Re revolution really has to do with um many of our physical systems really becoming uh not only digital but also based in uh cyber uh a cyber world including the internet of things um when mr uh, Trump was elected president in 2016, Ginny Rometty, the CEO of IBM, sent uh, a letter, an open letter to Mr. Trump that was uh, published in a large number of newspapers. And I'm paraphrasing here, but she basically said, we're just thrilled you're bringing back uh, manufacturing and that that's one of your big goals. But we don't want those old jobs. We don't want jobs in steel mills. We want new color jobs. And I just thought that so embodied what's happening, that the the jobs are now digital, that even even jobs that existed, um, you think about your UPS man on um, all of his records are all digital and um, it's uh, become ubiquitous across industries. As all of us know, and as we heard so eloquently from our uh, first speaker, uh, there is a huge uh, skills gap. Even before the coronavirus struck, when unemployment was at record low rates, uh, manufacturers were having a terrible time finding workers. Uh, I live in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I belong to a manufacturing group in Denver. And one of our big conversations last year was that Medtronic, the medical device manufacturer, uh, was busing people from northern Colorado an hour and a half each way, so a three-hour commute, because they could not find uh, workers, particularly workers with digital fabrication skills, so people who could run lasers and, and CNC machines. Um, and it was really in the uh, rural areas where people were still encouraging those that kind of training. And so it, you can see that it's a really extreme uh, need when somebody is actually sending buses across the state in order to get workers. The World Economic Forum um, very recently uh, did a big research study that uh, showed that about 75 million jobs worldwide they expect will be lost to automation by 2022, which is only in a few years. But conversely, they also predict that an estimated 133 million jobs will need workers with these kinds of new color skills, and that this is really creating a digital transformation across industries that's requiring a new kind of worker. Because in my laser manufacturing company, uh, in in those days, you couldn't find a, an operator or a technician who knew how to run lasers. I mean, I sold my company in 1999. So this is quite a while ago. And uh, we ended up doing in-house training and um, worked with the community college locally in Maryland, where our, our, our uh, factory was located. And people kept saying to me, <clears throat> can you help us create a curriculum, uh, a two-year curriculum? And I thought I was going to write a two-year curriculum, <clears throat> and I, but I didn't know exactly what it needed to be. I was uh, training people specifically for my company, which did laser micro-machining. And I didn't really know what the world needed. And uh, I being a market research person, I decided that I should do some market research and I interviewed the <clears throat> 200 manufacturers that ranged from uh, Fortune 10, so companies like Apple and Boeing, GE, uh, all the big names, all the really big employers, <clears throat> all the way to startups and of course the government research labs um, to try and see the, what were the common denominators <clears throat> that people needed. And um, it was really interesting. <clears throat> and I kind of knew this because I was an employer, of course, 
But the number one skill that people were looking for was problem solving. 95% of the people I spoke to of the 200 uh, immediately listed problem, problem solving skills. I really think this is because these new technologies are changing so rapidly and being introduced into mainstream industries uh, at such a rapid pace that there isn't the historical knowledge within the company of what to do when a machine goes down or how to uh, use a new application for that uh, or use that machine on a new application. Uh, and with the uh, speed at which life uh, progresses today, we're, um, we're really having to continually pro solve problems in, in new and innovative ways. Um, the second thing they were looking for was hands-on experience. And, and I was particularly looking at operators and technicians. I wasn't looking at engineers because that wasn't really where the skills gap was um, most prevalent. It was typically um, people running the machines or fixing them. And uh, one group in Louisville told me that they go out to the farms to recruit people because these are people who know how to fix things and have experience with uh, tools hands-on. Uh, the third thing, which I thought was going to actually be first, um, was digital and computer skills. <clears throat> um, Things like, of course, CAD, you can't run an analog CNC machine anymore. These machines are all uh, are all digital and are, require inputs from uh, CAD files, from computer-aided design files. But they also talked about a lot of things that had to do with IT. And again, as our previous speaker mentioned, um, <clears throat> the factory is really changing. And when I think of industry, 4.0, I think of the factory as a system <clears throat> and systems are tied together by digital uh, uh, connections. So when you think about the internet of things, when you think about feedback loops, <clears throat> and one of the other things that's happening is uh, a real emphasis on predictive analytics. Uh, a Deloitte study a few years ago uh, of international CEOs said the number one skill that they felt was going to keep their company uh, competitive was predictive analytics. Um, of course, we can't ignore 3D printing. <clears throat> um, I actually got very interested in, in this whole topic area. Uh, at a rapid conference a few years ago when HP introduced a production 3D printer and um, everyone was saying, uh, you know, you'd hear this at, at coffee breaks and cocktail parties and everyone was saying, I really want that machine, but I haven't got anybody to run it. And 3D printing is a very new technology that uh, was not on the curriculum when a lot of engineers went to school and we're having to catch up now. Uh, the other big one was at 3D Printing Service Tech, the people who had gotten into 3D printing, and those of you in the audience who uh, have 3D printers will uh, see this familiar scene. Uh, this was supposed to be parts for a, a, a prosthetic hand, and instead we got spaghetti. And being able to keep those machines running is, is really challenging as you bring new technology into, into your manufacturing plants, but also as you bring them into 3D printing, it's becoming um, ubiquitous, so as you're bringing it into other kinds of uh, industries as well. So I got done and I thought, <clears throat> um, a new kind of training is what we need. <clears throat> um, this two-year curriculum is, is really not fast enough for the employers. There's such a desperate need. Um, they need for it to be skill-specific. They're really searching for problem solving. Um, for the students, students have changed from when I went to school. I would wait and take a class. Today, the kids go onto YouTube, they figure it out, and I come back into my lab and, and a whole problem is solved because they were able to access information in a very quick and often free way. Um, they're also um, looking for uh, something more transferable. Um, a lot of a lot of young people know that it's not the straight trajectory anymore. And and again, as was mentioned earlier, lifelong learning is an important part of uh, today's 
uh, learner's uh, concept of what learning is, that it's not just you go to college, you get a job and you retire. It's really that you need this lifelong experience of upskilling in order to stay current for your job. And <clears throat> what I also realized is that um, what the worker uh, or what the employers were looking for is exactly what we learn in Fab Labs. We learn a lot of skills beyond the sp technology specific knowledge. Uh, we learn more than just running a 3D printer or a laser cutter. And the biggest one, I think, is identification and solving of authentic problems. For those of you who um, are familiar with MIT, um, our uh, coursework, like a lot of schools, is based on uh, problem sets. And my business partner uh, at Potomac Photonics um, was an MIT uh, grad, and I never knew anybody who could solve problems as well as he could. He complained about the process but that he had to go through, but, but it, that critical thinking and that being able to go in and solve a problem, even for our customers, which is not... Um, was not our field of expertise. He was often able to, to go in and really make a difference. Um, and I think that it, this really changed um, what, what I was thinking I was gonna do. And, um, and of course we know that uh, trained people are the key to a successful company. Um, and also <clears throat> retention is, so important because I read somewhere quite a long time ago, probably 10, 15 years ago, that it costs three times as much to uh, hire a new employee than to, um, ret to to retain someone who's who's within your company. And um, in in my company, I always found that it was the our people who were the who who made the difference and and who uh really really made us very special i think it was our our success it was so tied to the people that we worked with um where there's a lot of talk as as the davos people uh i mentioned earlier about cobots and what's happening is the robots are not um, out there on their own, that we still need humans to design, program, monitor, and yes, we do have to repair the robots. They don't they don't fix themselves yet. They might someday, but they don't right now. But I think the more important uh, issue here is that it's the humans that innovate. The machines don't innovate. The machines do the things that are um, dangerous. I, I think uh, the robots that are going into the coal mines now are, are really uh, saving a lot of lives and the health of our, of our workers. Um, but they also um, cannot think. And they have to do things at this point anyway, although we're seeing advances in machine learning, it's still based upon things that are inside the box. And if you really want someone to think outside the box, you have to go back to a, a human being. Um, and so what I hit upon uh, in my research when I realized I couldn't make it with a, with a two-year program was a digital badge. <clears throat> and <clears throat> digital badges were developed by IBM and Mozilla uh, quite a long time ago, decades ago. And um, they are based upon the concept of the Boy Scout and Girl Scout badges. And if you think about it, um, Boy Scouts get a badge for making campfires, for example, and they don't read about it in a book. They go out into the forest and they build a campfire. And so it's very much based on project-based learning, which develops those kinds of problem-solving skills that the employers were working for. Um, I looked at a lot of uh, platforms. Uh, there, are, there are international standards that the digital badges adhere to, to ensure that if someone says they have a badge, they actually do. Um, doesn't mean that they can't be hacked, but um, uh, the protocols are such that um, it's, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to hack them. Uh, and, I looked at a number of platforms and because I wanted to see as an employer, I wanted to see problem solving. 
Um, what I wanted was something that would include documentation of a project, so a portfolio. And our we came up with a platform. It was funded by America Makes, the Additive Manufacturing Institute. And our uh, portfolios include uh, photos or videos or reports. Um, uh, you can have animation, uh, something that describes how did you identify your problem? Uh, how did you go through solving your problem? And then a, a final uh, 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 solution. So we developed um, digital badges for new color job skills. Again, this was funded by America Make as well. And um, what I realized, I piloted it in my lab in New Mexico with Santa Fe Community College. And um, what I realized was that I didn't want to offer badges that were <clears throat> really just from my little lab in New Mexico. Um, I really wanted um, something that had had some real teeth. I wanted something that what the badge people call uh, um, uh, currency. And so with uh, 10 founding members who were from education and industry, uh, many of them were Fab Labs because that's the world I live in, um, but I didn't want it to just be Fab Labs. So um, we had a, a diverse group um, and uh, including three community colleges uh, and uh, we created, we vetted the badges and created a 501c3 um, and were recognized by the MIT Fab Lab Network, which is really powerful. So now instead of getting a badge from one location, you really have it from a robust organization. The real name, uh, the nonprofit name is the North American Digital Fabrication Alliance, but I always just call it the New Color Network. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, and I'm really thrilled that uh, Makerspace CT was the first uh, New Color Network member to offer badges outside of our pilot in Santa Fe. And um, I, I'm just thrilled, particularly because they're in New England and I have great ties to New England. And I, I think these programs are, um, uh, the, the ability to offer them around the country is really powerful. And then if someone moves, if someone goes from Santa Fe to Connecticut, they can continue and complete their program. I have found some ways, which I won't talk about in detail, um, but I have found some ways to do some of our badges online with coronavirus uh, using Zoom. Uh, it's not as much fun as in person, but uh, we're forging ahead uh, despite the pandemic. Um, but the big thing that really jumped out at me is when I did some consulting for the National Governors Association Future Workforce Now project in the last two, I guess, two years. Um, and what really um, was so strong uh, was that how these jobs are across industries. And so we're now looking at um, medical doctors who are seriously but looking at, at bioprinting. Bioprinting has come a really long way. I have a very good friend, Avi Reichenthal, who used to be the CEO of 3D Systems and now has a uh, VC company in California. And he and his partner um, own a vineyard and they have brought in amazing robotic uh, tools uh, that are helping them in the agricultural sector. We're looking at Walmart. At one of our roundtables, there was someone uh, from Walmart um, at the Future Workforce Now, uh, ta uh, one of the roundtables, um, who said, our biggest concern is we're starting to use, or, or we are using uh, robots that are uh, fulfilling janitorial uh, jobs and uh, in our stores, and we don't know who's going to fix them or program them when they. And we're really at a loss. Um, I've uh, put the link here to the NGA um, document that we put together, which was really a guide 
for the states in preparing for the workforce of the future. And um, we looked at best practices, but it was really startling how these kinds of um, tools are disrupting all industries, that it's not just manufacturing anymore. And I think the good news is you can train someone for a manufacturing job in in your facility or in your education institution, and actually they can uh, they have transferable skills that can go uh, on to be used in other fields as well. Um, I'm really thrilled um, that uh, with the help of IBM, uh, I, I could not have done this without IBM. Uh, the U.S. Department of Labor granted us a registered apprenticeship for a 3D printing technician. Our, um, I have two entities here. I have a for-profit um, contract manufacturing business, which is because I know how to do that, and that's how I fund my nonprofit and our education projects. And um, this was granted to our for-profit company, Fab Lab Hub LLC. And um, we are just, you know, so thrilled to be able to offer this. And um, apprenticeships, um, as was mentioned earlier, are very important in Europe and, and are starting to see a resurgence in the U.S. But I think what we really need are apprenticeships that are reimagined for the 21st century. And um, I think a great start is having apprenticeships for things like 3D printing and additive manufacturing and um, really extending beyond the trades that we normally think of. We think of um, apprentices in the um, building industry, for example. Um, but I think we, we have the opportunity to extend those to all of these new technologies and, and to create something for the, the future of work. Um, apprenticeships are, through the Department of Labor, are very structured. Um, fortunately, America Makes and the Urban Institute had worked um, with Youngstown State University to create a framework um, for the program, which, which for us will be about a year. and. Um, that framework made it really easy for me to uh, get my approval because I, I wasn't having to start from scratch. And um, the programs uh, are a work-learn situation. So it's, it's learning on the job, um, but it's not just a learning on the job. Uh, there's also a formal education component to it. And so fortunately, because we have the digital badge program, uh, it, it meshes really beautifully. And um, our apprenticeship will uh, include our digital badges. It will include the IBM IT badges, which are have um, uh, subject matter such as cybersecurity, um, which is a hot topic uh, right now in, in factories. Um, and it's it's rigorous. It's a full time job. It is very different from an internship. Apprentices typically have about a ninety percent retention rate, um, and that is because both parties um, believe that this is leading to a full time job for the for the worker. In New Mexico, um, our apprenticeship uh, pays uh, thirty eight thousand dollars a year as well as the training uh, classes, which are all free. Um, IBM has been very generous to, to um, workers in that regard in, for their badges. And, um, and that leads to um, a, a position that pays 60000 a year, which in New Mexico, which is a very poor state, um, uh, is is really an important ad, uh, advance. Uh, this picture is of John Ford. He's not 3D printing. He is uh, actually running a laser cutter in my in my former company, Potomac Photonics. Um, but John is a great story. John, um, I, I see these uh, uh, alternative education models as pathways. Um, it might be, you know, college isn't for everybody. 
college was for me. I have way more degrees than I than I need, um, but because I loved school, but. Um, it's not for everybody. And John was at a, uh, did one semester at a community college near my factory. His uh, aunt worked for us. Uh, she was our um, uh, finance person and uh, she got him this job as an operator. And uh, he used to say to me when we would do our our work he would he would say you know i i love math so much but i just didn't like school and i i like that i'm here i'm applying math and uh john has gone on to become an engineer and runs for laser labs for potomac and um i think it's a great example of how people can come into a, a field that they didn't even know was possible um and and really see some some amazing opportunities um this is becoming a national movement um and people ask me all the time about the recognition of credentials um just this july um jenny rometty and uh, led a task force at the white house um, and uh, Tim Cook was on this task force uh, from Apple as, long, as well as a number of other companies. And uh, they put forth a, um, a federal uh, directive for all of the government agencies in their hiring practices to start to focus on skills over degrees. And that is really huge when you think about how uh, the US government, I believe, is still the largest employer in the United States. And so as we start to see this, IBM, of course, has had um, uh, an emphasis on skills for many years. Um, Ginny told me uh, when I was originally um, uh, writing the book, uh, that fifteen percent at that time of their employees, the job requirement did not require a college degree. And um, Bob Welsh, who is uh, part of Stanley Black and Decker in Maryland, Black and Decker used to be uh, separate, and which is how I remember them. And Bob Welsh, who at the time that I met him, was the VP of of the Innovation Accelerator. Um, told me that he really believed that in um, five to 10 years, people would just not be going to college. Um, I don't know if that's true. I think if I wanted uh, a brain surgeon, I would have, I would want him to go to college. Um, but there are many jobs for which college is not necessary and where it's not the right choice. And in many of these um in many of these situations uh, where you're for, like badges or apprenticeships, um, you're not saddled with debt at the end and it makes it a more affordable way. So, you know, uh, you can pay for college um, while you're working at a good job. And um, I, I think it gives people a lot more opportunities. And it's those opportunities that I really believe we need in order to bring back the middle class and and really uh, change the way that we think about um, uh, our country and and what's really important in our lives. Um, I uh, uh, did want to. Um, mentioned that in, in addition to the New Color Workforce book, which um, was published by Photonics Media Press, um, we recently uh, created a book using augmented reality. I found that the um, the people that I really wanted to read the book, I mean, Bob Welsh wrote me a fabulous review of the book. And, you know, there were so many people who, who responded so positively to it, but it but I really wanted to reach um, young people who are more interested in video uh, than than books, and so we created an augmented reality book that um, triggers videos from the photographs of people, and they can tell their story. And there are some wonderful stories, including. Uh, 
somewhere in the slides, there was a photograph of um, a ring of the Taos Pueblo. And the woman who designed that is here in Santa Fe. And she talks about having not even graduated from junior high and is a Mexican immigrant. And she taught herself CAD and designs this gorgeous jewelry that we 3D print the molds for. And then her husband has the casting company that cast in Sterling. And there's just some beautiful stories. And um, I think that the, the opportunities are, are huge and we have to grasp them. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna stop sharing. There we go. <laughs> Using augmented reality, I found that the um, the people that I really wanted to read the book. I mean, Bob Welsh wrote me a fabulous review of the book, and you know there were so many people who who responded so positively to it. But it, I really wanted to reach um, young people who are more interested in video uh, than than books. And so we created an augmented reality book that um, triggers videos from the photographs of people and they can tell their story. And there were some wonderful stories, including uh, somewhere in the slides, there was a photograph of... Um, Hi, Sarah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hi, Sarah. This is Jim Fuller. I'm, I'm uh, on the board of uh, directors of Makerspace CT, and I'm also the chair of the Department of Architecture at the University of Hartford. So it's a pleasure to meet you. I was fascinated by your talk and uh, very interesting. It's an uh, incredible transition that we're going through, and I'm very pleased to be here and be able to um, chat with you and, and ask you a few questions for our, uh, for our uh, listeners here and watchers. Um, I was very fascinated by the apprenticeship that you talked about and how that's a key to, uh, I think, uh, certainly expanding skills and developing a, a permanent position in a company and, and good for employees, good for the employers. Uh, can you elaborate, elaborate a little bit more about that, about how, how do companies actually start these apprenticeships? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, apprenticeships um, are mired in government agency language and um, uh, and in uh, bureaucracy. And so it is um, challenging to, uh, as I said in my talk, I could not have gotten through that without IBM. I mean, IBM really helped us so tremendously. They have, because they're IBM, they have a person who is embedded in the US Department of Labor. And when they can't get an answer to something, this guy just walks over to the correct office and knocks on the door and gets the answer. And um, I had been trying for nine months uh, working with the state of New Mexico um, to try to, to pull this together. And uh, I couldn't understand most of the language in the documents. Um, uh, I, and I had just thrown up my hands. And, uh, and fortunately, I was speaking at the Consumer Electronics Show. So, so the um, augmented reality book was on Gary's book club for who is the, the, um, CEO of the Consumer Elect uh, Consumer Technology Association that produces CES and Jennifer Odo from IBM heard me speak, and um, uh, she came up to me and said, "You know, I really want to work with you." So you know, time went on and we were doing some projects together. And I said to her, "I'm so frustrated with this trying to get this through." And what has happened is that. Um, people have um, created intermediaries because it's so hard 
to get through the process. And so um, Youngstown State is actually an intermediary. Um, Jennifer had worked with them and she put me together with them. And so between IBM and Youngstown State as the intermediary who um, kind of has the process put together, we were able to get it in uh, 45 days. And I had been working on this for nine months. And so it's not for the faint of heart. Um, <clears throat> I think the important thing is to find a champion, is to find a, co a connection. Um, certainly IBM uh, and or Youngstown State, and I can um, put into the uh, chat, um, what uh, uh, how to reach them, but uh, Youngstown State's uh, IT program with IBM uh, is a facilitator. Um, and I, I think that's the only way to go. Um, the, it's, it's, um, people talk about how they're trying to make it easier. And um, the Secretary of Workforce Solutions here in New Mexico told me it was really easy, but it really wasn't easy. <laughs> And um, I, I think you need to make those those connections with your uh, workforce boards. Um, it's you, you really need help from somebody. And and you know I I, I do pretty well at stuff. <laughs> and, and it was hard. It's clear. It's clear. You do. Yes. Yeah. Hard. It was really yeah. hard. And um, uh, so yeah, that's okay. what I. That's what I would recommend. And just, just a, kind of a quick follow-up to that too. I think the you mentioned the apprenticeships are are uh, ninety percent retention rate, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, mm -hmm. I would imagine it might be sometimes where, in the best intentions, the employee employer just doesn't work out. Maybe the mm -hmm. the apprenticeship is also designed to provide that opportunity for an employer to understand the business. What happens if the employer just doesn't? or play rather just doesn't connect with that. Is it easy? I'm sure it's not easy, but is it possible to transfer sort of a crude apprenticeship to some other company and how, how might that work? Um, I've never done that myself, um, but um, it's not possible to transfer to another company. The apprenticeship lives at the company or the Absolutely. employer. It can be a nonprofit, but it lives with the employer it doesn't live with the employee is my understanding so um if they've completed the apprenticeship and they're now a journeyman then it transfers hmm. so okay. you, yeah you have if, if you're halfway through it does, i don't think it transfers hmm. okay uh we do have another question here from from the uh, from people watching um uh, what badges will be offered in the future to envision any sort of what's coming down a future is unpredictable, of course, and things are changing all the time, but what do you see as other possible badges in the future? The um, uh, emphasis was originally on additive manufacturing um, because that was where my funding was <laughs> and you tend to work with where your funding is. Um, and also 3D printing is becoming so um, uh, important in, in particularly in manufacturing, but across industries. Um, our CNC badge, uh, CNC machining badge will be up shortly. Um, I'm working with uh, Wright State University and um, with uh, an old colleague from the Laser Institute of America on uh, photonics badges um, that will include lasers and optics. Um, I probably would have done that one first if I hadn't had the funding because um, lasers I, are just so cool. But uh, that one will be um, up, sh probably th those two will be up in the next probably 30 days, I'm thinking, 30, 35 days. The, um, uh, but I'm working with UNM with uh, actually someone from the architecture school uh, on a badge who's a Columbia grad. Um, it, it's just an amazing guy, Tim Castillo. And I'm working with Tim on design thinking. Um, and so I want to do more on um, uh, 
kind of that critical thinking design thinking process as well as one in prototyping um i think there are so many entrepreneurship things out there but not very much on prototyping and understanding the prototyping process um we also have a um a new contract with America makes to take our badges and slide them down into, into mini badges uh, as preparation for um, the full badge for people who don't have background. Fantastic. That's great to see the future coming here. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, thinking about the current situation we've been in for the last nine months. And this is this is a question I did expect, but it's, it's good to see it. Um, if the if COVID gets worse or just stays with us for a longer than we expect, um, how do how can people learn these skills uh, if they have to be remote uh, coming not coming to a facility? How can they earn these badges or learn these skills? Last summer, um, this past summer, uh, we piloted um, a, a virtual version of Design for Three D Printing. And we are able to, normally what happens, because this is the first class, you're just learning design, but you're not running the machines yet. Um, normally what happens is my interns, because I also have an internship program, a paid internship program with students from the community college. And the interns um, run the designs. And so they print the part and the person gets to see it and iterate the design because it's never right the first time and you go through this process. It usually takes the whole six weeks to get your, your project finished. And what we did was um, the class is on go to meeting and people uh, submit their design. The interns um, print them. And we had people in the class from San Diego, Boston and Albuquerque, which is about an hour from us. Um, and uh, what they did was they photographed and videotaped the designs and then people could see them. They emailed it to them and they could see how it, how it turned out. And then at the end, we disinfected it and mailed it to, to the student. Um, for um, FDM 3D printing, uh, we have a new relationship with Matter Hackers and who are a distributor of um, uh, consumer um, 3D printers and other kinds of tools and filament. And uh, we're going to do a project where uh, the student has the 3D printer mailed, shipped to them. And so they have it at home and they can run the printer at home. Now the printers have become a lot more user friendly. Mm. Years ago, you couldn't have done that. <laughs> but they're, they're to the point. And, and they have two printers that are under uh, $800. And, and, you know, if it's someone who's upskilling for a job, they might want to use um, a, a, a more robust printer, like the Ultimator that we use in our lab. Um, but it gives them an option to work on it at home. And then you can do multiple badges. So uh, the badges stack into a master badge and you could do multiple badges, you know, with one machine and, and then you could use it for other kinds of schoolwork. Yeah. So, um, and since we're all not spending any money, um, going out, um, it, you know, uh, it seems like it was not an onerous um, uh, cost associated. It is fascinating how the price of 3D printers has come down so much. We we have a 3D printing facility in our in our department, but we have some students who have actually gone on and, and bought their own machine because it's more flexible for them and they can just schedule the time when they have it or be it at home. And it's it's led to de then developing the skills so much quicker. Yeah. By having that flexibility and that immediacy of being able to use it. But you, good. Get, you get the practice. Right. Yeah, you get that hands-on practice, which you can't with a, with a remote access. Um, another question about, this is related to supply chains. Uh, how do you see the new collar workforce contributing when the supply chains break during the next pandemic? The next pandemic, we're not through this one yet, but the next pandemic. 
this is a, a question near and dear to my heart. Um, so we built 30,000 face shields um, using die cutting that mostly went to the Navajo Nation and the Pueblos. I, I live in Indian territory, as, as many people call it. And we built, um, uh, we have an R&D project with Stanford build N95 material. Um, but my big project was really um, working with Avi Reichenthal and Nexa 3D to build, um, uh, to 3D print uh, test swabs. So the Navajo hospitals had no swabs. And um, I did some on, on our uh, form labs machine, but there I could only do 700 a day. On Avi's machine, I could do 12,000 a day. So the state needed about 100,000 swabs. And so I thought, well, I can, you know, I could just knock this out. And um, so, you know, by the time you go through the approvals and the test and it had to be tested and all of this, um, the pandemic wasn't as raging as it had been. And so at the height of the uh, supply chain, uh, you know, break, uh, the swabs from Form Labs were selling for four dollars each. Um, ours were selling for three because I could do high volume. Um, and I worked on um, a robotic uh, solution where we had, you know, really got out the labors and you could run twenty four seven. And I got the my costs down to a dollar fifty. Per swab, and so I called the um, state to get the approval um, that has to come through the state de health department for the hospital to buy them. And I and I have an FDA certified lab, um, and you know we start going through what I have to do. And I said to the uh, this, the guy from the state, um, I hear that you're going to buy that you need to buy a hundred thousand swabs. And, and he said, yeah, you know, but the South Korean supply chain is back open and we're going to get them from South Korea. And, and I said to him, well, what are they charging you? And he said, 50 cents. That was his price, not cost. That was his price was 50 cents. And my cost was $1.50, which means I had, would have had to charge, you know, at least $2 um, to cover overhead in GNA. And and then he says, um, but they're price gouging us because it's normally three cents. And so, and and I'm like, well, there's no way 3D printing. And and 3D printing is not competitive um, on high volume. So people say to me all the time, you should sell your earrings. And I think if I wanted to be in the jewelry business, I would get a mold and, you know, send it to China and I'd have, I could pay less than a penny a piece. I shudder to think what these cost me to make because you know, my time. And I, I really think that, um, and I'm digressing a little bit from your exact question, but the thing I'd like to see happen between now and the next pandemic is that we really get the government, speaking of policy, to invest in um, uh, local manufacturing. And, um, you know, I can knock out the swabs and you know drive them down to Albuquerque and on um, without the, waiting for a container ship to come from from Asia when you've got emergency. But unless there's enormous emergency like the height of the pandemic we've just seen, um, the cost is prohibitive. And and um, I really like to see us lead. Uh, and spearhead discussion with states and with the feds on how do we, and, and I've seen a little bit of discussion of this with the Biden administration coming in um, of looking at uh, supporting manufacturing uh, because unless we, you know, and and it's okay to make something for the height of the emergency, but I, I have a long-term business. You know, I, I don't want to go through all this and, and, and then have to wait for the next emergency. I really want to sell product all the time. And yeah. so I think we have to work. I, I, I see our group is really having some force behind us and, and seeing if there's a way that, that we can impact 
the investment that needs to be made in American manufacturing. Well, it certainly seems like the, the, the pandemic has, has allowed us or forced us to think differently about manufacturing and, and the, the timeliness of that and supplying of that. But it obviously leads to quicker supplies, but also even without a pandemic, relying on a, on a source that could be uh, insecure or take a lot of time regardless of, of pandemic conditions is, you know, is not the way to go. We need to look at what happens here and, yeah. and strengthen the own, their own economy, our own economy. So that's, that's good. Yeah. Um, another question here, uh, this is a little bit different certainly, but uh, do you need to need to have previous CAD design experience to take classes? Um, the prerequisite um, is that you either take our introduction to digital design, which is basically an introductory CAD class, um, or that you take one of the existing classes that are out there. So um, Autodesk, for example, uses a digital badge program to, to certify their, their, pro, their uh, software. Um, the program that we use is Tinkercad to get started. It has excellent tutorials. For the digital natives, it goes really fast. I have a young woman who uh, is off from school who's going to come work with us, and she went through the tutorials in, in a week, uh, designed this gorgeous piece and uh, uh, something she needed for her desk, and that was actually pretty complex. And so, um, but that first class, the intro to digital design, should give you enough to, to get started. Well, you did mention that uh, that a woman in New Mexico who learned CAD herself to make her own jewelry molds, and that's that's phenomenal. That's fantastic. Um, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, those are all the questions that have come in on the chat so far. But uh, I, I'm curious about one thing you mentioned early about uh, you know the the survey you took that where employees name their skills that they want to see in the next uh, employees, and one was problem solving skills, and and I think you you touched on that pretty well with that. But can you elaborate on on how the the digital badging process can help develop these problem solving skills? Well, um, in project-based learning, um, we use authentic projects. So um, a lot of people think of project-based learning as kids doing projects. But as an employer, you know, I know that half the battle is identifying the problem, right? Mm. Figuring out there is a problem. And so um, I helped start a fab lab in Roxbury um, in inner city Boston with a middle school. And we would go across the street to the um, grocery store and the kids would identify problems. And it was just really fun, you know. Mm. And so people in the class come in, we give them some background on what 3D printing is, if it's 3D printing or, you know, what the process is. And um, and uh, once they understand, particularly with 3D printing, the capabilities of 3D printing, they, the assignment, the first class assignment is to go home and think about um, uh, a problem either at work or at home or in, in the schoolyard or, you know, on the golf course or something that you would mm -hmm. like. And so once the person has identified the problem, we usually um, have to whittle it down to something manageable that we can do in the six weeks. And then the entire six weeks is spent on solving the problem. So you design, you design something and, and a great example is my earrings because you design it, you know, I designed the cubes and I designed it. I had not used an FDM printer before. I had used stereolithography. And when I designed it, um, I designed the hole for the little, you know, metal parts to go in. And it all collapsed. <laughs> 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 it's heat and it collapsed. 
left and then I um I realized I had to do something else and you know it's that process and and what you see in the class is it you know it never goes well the first time and then right. figuring out how how do you um, how how do you get over that problem and I think that's a really um important bit of information for the employer it's mm. it's like um did the person cheat? Did they cut corners? Did they come up with something innovative? How did they how did they solve the problem? And then your final picture of your your final item, you know, tells the story. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. Well, I, we unfortunately we are running out of time, but I, I want to thank you, Sarah. It's it's been great hearing your your talk and and uh, and having a chance to chat with you and, and answer, answer some questions. So thank you very much for your time today in your presentation. We appreciate that. And it's great to as being someone in higher education. It's I'm always interested in new pathways to education. So thank you for enlightening us on, on those. Um, it was a pleasure. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And uh, now uh, we're going to go to our next segment. And Drew has a message from the team at Makerspace Connecticut. And then Mark will take us into the next segment. Thank you for joining us today. Support for the New England Maker Summit provided by our innovation partner, Stanley Black & Decker. Additional sponsors include the Rutledge Family Foundation, Mastercam, MPH Engineering LLC, CBIA, ReadyCT, and Constep. Thank you for your support.